Once upon a time, an angel in heaven had a goose. She used to take good care of the goose. But once it happened that when goose was laying egg, it fell off from heaven to earth. After some days, a gosling came out of that egg. It was cute little gosling from the heaven. Years went by and in the nearby village, there lived a farmer with his wife. They were very poor. They had nothing but a little farm where they grew vegetables that they could eat. He used to sell those vegetables and earn his livelihood. One day, the farmer's wife told him, Wouldn't it be good if we could have some eggs from time to time? I wish we had a goose to lay us eggs daily. The farmer did not have much cash to buy a goose. So, he collected some veggies and set off to the marketplace to sell all of them and perhaps get a goose in exchange. He took the goose home and took a very good care of it. He made a nest for it to lay eggs. The goose will produce eggs which I can use for selling and eating, thought the farmer. Days passed and one fine morning when he went to gather some eggs for his breakfast, to his surprise the goose had laid a golden egg. Little he knew that the goose was from that egg that was fallen from the heaven. A golden egg? If what I'm saying is true, then I'll be a rich man soon, thought the farmer. He sold the egg in the market and got a good handsome amount for it to get rid of all his problems. But still, he felt that the money he got is not enough. So he waited curiously for the goose to lay another egg. He started taking very good care of it. Soon the morning came when he found another golden egg. He and his wife were so happy to see the egg. He immediately ran towards the market. Again he got a very good deal for the egg and he was soon known as rich man in the village. Days passed and slowly and steadily the farmer and his wife were becoming richer and richer. But as they became richer, the couple had also turned greedy and selfish. They both wanted all the richness in the world for them as soon as possible. One day, wife came up with the plan. What if we get all the golden eggs at one time? The farmer was also fascinated with the idea she had put forth. So, they both decided to cut the goose and get all the eggs inside her at one go. But greed has its own way of teaching lesson. They picked up a big sharp knife and cut the goose's belly to take out all the golden eggs right away. But it was a huge mistake. They did not find even a single egg inside the goose. And there would never be any more golden eggs again. Poor goose lost its life and the old couple lost the only source of becoming rich. So they say greed is a curse. Once upon a time, very long ago, an old couple lived in a village far away in a little cottage. The old woman was very fond of cooking and making special treats every day. One day, she read in her recipe book how to bake a gingerbread. She decided to make one. To enhance her treat, she made a figure out from the dough. Figure of a boy. She made two eyes on it with vanilla cream and lips with strawberry cream. She also dressed it with different colors and called it gingerbread boy. She then put the gingerbread boy into the oven to bake it. It was only after few minutes when she heard voices coming from the oven. 
Let me out. Please let me out. It's too hot in here. Please let me out. Someone seemed to be saying. Who could it be? She thought and opened the oven door. As soon as she opened the door of the oven, Gingerbread Boy jumped out and started running. The old couple could not believe on their eyes. Before they could realize anything, the Gingerbread Boy reached the road outside. They too ran behind the Gingerbread Boy. Both of them shouted, Stop, Stop little Gingerbread, gingerbread boy. boy! We, we want, want to, to eat, eat you! you. Stop. Stop! They were panting as they ran. They ran a little while but could not catch him. He was too fast for them. The gingerbread boy had gone only a little distance when he crossed the cow in the farm. The cow called for him. Stop little boy, stop. You look so delicious. I want to eat you. But the gingerbread boy didn't give a heed. He did not stop running. He saw cow running after him. The cow tried hard but could not catch him. He was too fast for the cow too. The gingerbread boy had not gone very far when he met a horse. I'm very hungry and you look so yummy. I must eat you. Stop! Said the horse running after the gingerbread boy. When gingerbread boy saw the horse running behind him, he started running faster. The horse did not want the gingerbread boy to run away. On the other hand, gingerbread boy ran as fast as he could to be escaped. No doubt, the gingerbread boy had escaped the attack of an old couple and the cow successfully. He was sure to escape the horse's attack too. It was the question of his life. So he ran faster than the hungry horse. Soon he ran out of the reach of the horse too. The little gingerbread boy was sure that nobody could catch him now. As he was running through the forest, a sly old fox saw him. The gingerbread boy would make a good supper. The fox thought and called. Hey little boy, stop! I want to talk to you. But the gingerbread boy knew what the cunning fox was up to. So he did not stop and continued running. The fox too gave in a hot chase. Not bothered, the ginger boy sang as he ran. He was too fast for the fox too. But the fox did not give up. He too continued his chase of gingerbread boy with a watering mouth. He had already decided to catch and eat gingerbread boy by hook or crook. Soon the gingerbread boy reached the river bank. He did not know how to swim. Moreover, he was afraid that if he goes into the water, he would get dissolved and die. He found himself in a fix. What should I do now? He said to himself as he stood on the rock on the bank of the river, Meanwhile, Fox to reach the river bank and decided to take advantage of the problem. The fox went up to the gingerbread boy and said, Don't worry, I'll take you across the river. You just jump on my tail. I know how to swim. The fox told the gingerbread boy very innocently. The gingerbread boy now believed every word of the clever fox. He jumped onto his tail. Midway in the river, the fox said, I cannot hold you on my tail. You would be safer if you come onto my back. The gingerbread boy had no choice. He did as the fox told him to do. He knew fox was planning something ugly in his mind. But he did not let the fox know about his suspicion. You are too heavy for my back too. The fox told him after he swam a little more distance. Why don't you jump onto my head? Why not? Whatever you say. And the gingerbread boy jumped onto fox's head being very cautious. After some time the fox again said, It would be easier for me to carry you on my nose. We would soon be on the other side of the river. Then you would be free to go. 
wherever you want to go. As soon as the fox reached the other end of the river, he tossed the gingerbread boy high up and the fox was ready with an open mouth and closed eyes to gobble him up in no time. But nothing came down. When he opened his eyes, he saw gingerbread boy on the tree above saying, Better luck next time, you cunning sly old fox. This time, eat the dust. Ha 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 ha! The Elves and the Shoemaker There was once a shoemaker who worked very hard and made very good shoes. But still, he could not earn enough to make his living. At last, all his money ran out and he had only enough leather left to make one more pair of shoes. That evening, he cut out the leather, ready to be stitched up the following morning. And then he followed his wife upstairs to bed feeling very sad. He rose again at sunrise, said his prayers and was about to settle down to work when to his amazement he saw the shoes all stitched up and ready on the table. The good man could not understand how it had happened. He examined the shoes carefully and found that they were quite beautifully stitched and finished off. The same day a customer came into the shop and bought the shoes and because they were of such excellent quality, he was willing to pay the double the usual price for them. With this money, the cobbler had bought enough leather for two more pairs of shoes. Again he cut them out and again he left the leather on his bench overnight, thinking he would stitch them together the following morning. But when he awoke, he found that the work had already been done for him. The two pairs of shoes were as beautifully made as the first and soon found willing buyers. And the shoemaker received enough money for them to buy leather for four more pairs. Soon it went on for weeks and months. Each evening the shoemaker would carefully cut out the leather, say his prayers and retire to bed. And each morning he would find the shoes standing soon and ready in neat rows on the bench. Eight pairs at first, then twelve, then twenty, and almost too many pairs to count. And he had so many customers that now he could afford to buy the finest skins and other costly materials besides. He cut out knee-high boots of the softest suit for the lords to wear when they rode off with their hounds to the hunt, and shoes of silk and brocade and velvet for the ladies to wear with their fashionable ball gowns. And before many months had passed, the shoemaker grew so rich that he began to want to share his prosperity with his invisible helpers. One night, he and his wife hid behind a pile of leather hides to see who these helpers were. At midnight, two little naked men appeared and hey presto, they stitched up all the shoemaker's shoes for him. Then they disappeared. The shoemaker's wife was very sorry for them because of their nakedness and she at once set to work to sew them the loveliest little clothes while the shoemaker made them a pair of pointed silk shoes. They laid the present out and were on the watch again at midnight as the little men came in to do their work. When the elves saw their clothes, they were delighted. They put them on and laughed and danced all around the room and they skipped out into the street never to be seen again. But the shoemaker continued to be successful and prosperous in his work for the rest of his days. The Emperor's New Clothes Many years ago, there lived an emperor who loved fancy clothes so much that he spent all his money on elegant suits and cloaks. He took no interest in his army or the theatre or in driving through the country unless it was to show off his new clothes. One day, two swindlers arrived in the city. 
They told everyone that they were weavers and could weave the very finest materials imaginable. Not only were the colors and designs unusually attractive, but the clothes made from these materials were so fine that they were invisible to anyone who wasn't terrifically smart and fit for his job. The emperor thought, Well, they must be wonderful clothes indeed. If I wore them, I could see which one of my statesmen were unfit for their jobs and also be able to tell the clever ones from the stupid. And he paid a large sum of money to the swindlers to make them start work. The swindlers then made a great fuss about setting up their workshop. They put up looms and pretended to be weaving, but there was no thread on the looms. They demanded the richest silks and finest gold thread, which they promptly hid in their own bags, and then they went on walking far into the night at the empty looms. I wonder how they're getting on, the emperor thought again, and then he became rather nervous. He was a bit worried at the idea that a man who was stupid or unfit for his job would not be able to see what was woven. Not that he thought he was no good, oh no, but all the same, he would feel happier if someone else had a look at the stuff first. I'll send my honest old Prime Minister to the weavers, he thought. So off went the honest old Prime Minister to the weavers workshop, where they were sitting at the empty looms. Good gracious me! <laughs> Why, why, I can't see a thing. But he was careful not to say so. Good Lord, is it possible that I'm stupid? <laughs> I must on no account admit that I can't see the material. One of the weavers asked, Well, what do you think of our work? Oh, it's, it's charming. It's exquisite. <laughs> what, what a pattern and what coloring. I shall certainly praise it to the emperor. <laughs> the old minister listened carefully as the swindlers gave details of the colors and the design and repeated it all to the emperor. The swindlers now demanded more money, more silk and more gold thread to continue the weaving. They stuffed it all into their own pockets and continued to pretend to weave on the empty frames. By and by, the emperor sent another trusted official to see how the weaving was going on. The same thing happened to him as to the prime minister. He couldn't see anything but the empty looms. I know, I am not stupid. So it must be my fine job I am not fit for. I mustn't let anyone know. And so he praised the material that he couldn't see and told the emperor of its charming shades and beautiful design and weave. Then the emperor himself said he must see it and invited all his court to come with him. When they arrived at the workshop, they found the cunning swindlers weaving for all they were worth at the empty looms. Hey, look, isn't it magnificent? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. It's really beautiful. All the officials said, feeling sure that the others could see it. The emperor thought, What's this? I can't see anything. This is dreadful. Am I stupid? Am I not fit to be emperor? This is the most awful thing that could happen to me. Oh, oh, it's quite exquisite. He said aloud. It has our gracious approval. He nodded at the empty loom, for he wasn't going to say that he couldn't see anything. Then all the courtiers nodded and smiled at the empty loom and said, yeah. Yes, yes, it's, it's awesome. quite exquisite, it's yes. On the eve of the grand procession, they announced. There, the emperor's new clothes are finished. Indeed, they are. And when morning came, 
the emperor went in person to the weaver's workshop ah <laughs> your imperial majesty the two weavers bowed in unison as the emperor made his entrance you do us honor indeed and the one poised each thumb each finger daintily aloft as if holding up a confection really too delicate for human handling here your majesty are the breeches he said almost in awe while the other went through the same gesturing motions with a full sum and here is the robe ah oh, and now the mantle you can feel they are as light as down you can hardly tell you have anything on your majesty that's the beauty of them <laughs> mm, yes indeed will your imperial majesty now graciously take off your clothes said the swindler then we can fit you with the new ones indeed in front of the big looking glass so the gentleman in waiting helped the emperor out of the clothes he was wearing upon which the swindlers set about their pretense of dressing him in the new raiment they were supposed to have made they took their time about it the emperor twisting and turning this way and that the while apparently admiring himself in the ample mirror gentlemen the first one at last challenged the bemused courtiers perfection would you not say and all the courtiers exclaimed goodness how well they fit your majesty what a cut wow what colors the master of ceremonies came in to announce the canopy to be carried above your majesty's head is ready and the procession is waiting tell them i am ready said the emperor then he turned around once more in front of the glass to make quite sure that everyone thought he was looking at his fine clothes the emperor marched off in the procession under the grand canopy and everyone in the streets and at their windows said good gracious look at the emperor's new clothes oh they are the finest he's ever had the emperor's new clothes were praised by everyone but but he hasn't got anything on exclaimed a little child hey what are you saying cried the father the people around him had heard however and repeated the child's words in a whisper and then someone said them a bit louder he hasn't got anything on there is a little child over there saying he hasn't got anything on that's right that's right he, he hasn't, hasn't got, got anything, anything on they all shouted at last and the emperor began to feel very uncomfortable and embarrassed for it seemed to him that the people were right but his royal upbringing prevented him from running away and he thought to himself i must go through with it now procession and all and he drew himself up haughtily while the chamberlains tripped after him bearing the train that wasn't there jack and the beanstalk once upon a time there was a poor woman who lived in a humble cottage in the countryside with her only son whose name was Jack they owned a cow that gave more milk than any other cow in the neighborhood and they made butter and cheese with the extra milk and sold it at the market nearby but one day the cow went dry and there was no milk to make butter and cheese there was not even a milk for them to drink they ate less every day but before long they had almost nothing left to eat and no money to buy food jack was still too young to work and his mother had fallen ill jack's mother called him to her bedside i am too weak to go out myself jack so you must take the cow to the market and sell there for as much money 
as you can. Yes, mother. Jack liked going to market, but he was sad that they would have to sell the cow. He set out, walking slowly, and had gone about half the way when an old man stopped him. Do you want to sell that cow? I will buy her from you in exchange of this magic beans. The beans, which were all different colors, were very beautiful, and the old man had said they were magic. So Jack gave him the cow and ran home with the beans. Look, mother, what I have got! He cried as he hurried into her room. But his mother was furious when she saw that. He had come home without any money for the cow. What? You've sold our good cow for these worthless beans? And she threw them out of the window. That evening, Jack and his mother ate their last crust of bread and went to bed very sadly, for they knew that there was nothing left for breakfast. Jack woke up early next morning, still hungry. He was so hungry, in fact, that he jumped out of bed and went into the garden to look for something to eat. To his amazement, he saw that the magic beans had grown into a huge plant that stretched right up over the roof and disappeared into the sky. The stems of the plant were so thickly twisted that he could climb up them as if they were the rungs of a ladder. He began to pull himself up higher. And higher, and higher. At last, he reached the top of the bean stalk. In front of him was a white road, which led to a great castle far in the distance. There was no one to be seen, so he started to walk along the road. Maybe someone at the castle would give him something to eat. In any case, it would certainly be an adventure. He was hot. And tired and hungrier than ever, by the time he reached the castle, its great gate was shut. But Jack knocked on it loudly. After a while, it was opened by a huge, ugly old woman, who had only one eye in the middle of her forehead. Oh! She cried. I need a boy just like you to clean out the vase for me every day. Come in quickly, come in and hide, or my husband will see you and eat you up. Frightened, Jack hurried inside at once and told the giantess he would become her servant in exchange for something to eat. She gave him a piece of bread and a glass of buttermilk. But while he was drinking it. In the castle, walls began to shake with a heavy tread, and Jack could hear the giant coming closer. "Quick, quick! Hide behind the cupboard!" whispered the giantess. And Jack slipped out of sight as the giant stamped into the room, shouting, "Oh, oh, 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 oh! Fee, fee, fo, fo! I smell the blood of an Englishman! I smell the blood of an Englishman!" Be he alive or be he dead, be he alive or be he dead, I'll grind his bones to make my bread. I'll grind his bones to make my bread. Fee fee fo fo. Nonsense! It's only a nice young elephant that I cooked for your breakfast. Sit down and eat it while it's hot. So the giant sat down, ate his breakfast, and forgot all about the Englishman. Who stood watching him from behind the cupboard? When he had finished, he called out, "Wife, mm. bring me my magic hen. I want to see some new golden eggs." <laughs> Jack could hardly believe his eyes when he saw what happened next. The giantess brought in a little brown hen and put it on the table in front of her husband. Hey, you, lay, lay. The giant commanded, and plop, plop, plop. She immediately laid one, two, and three golden eggs. The giant scooped the eggs into his pocket. Then he settled back in a chair, and soon was snoring so loudly that the castle walls shook with the noise. Jack 
She crept out from behind the curtain, snatched up the magic cane, and ran out of the castle as fast as his legs would carry him. With the hen tucked under his arm, he climbed quickly down the beanstalk and hurried into the cottage up to his mother's room. She was very happy to see him again. She cried with joy, and then she cried some more, because now they would have as many golden eggs as they wanted and never be poor again. But Jack soon began to long for another adventure. So one morning, he set out again up the beanstalk, higher, 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 until he reached the top. This time, he has dyed his hair black. and giantess did not recognize him ha oh, you are just the boy to help me clean out the chicken run and chase the mice away hurry inside for my husband sees you he will